Welcome to another episode of The Breakdown. And this episode represents a bit of a first for us. While we have had a wide diversity of guests on the show, we've had uh, leaders of political parties, we've had MLAs, we've had subject matter experts, we've had academics, we've had people with lived experience, we have never had a member of the UCP caucus on our show. Today, we are extremely excited to be able to welcome a member of the UCP caucus who has been making a bit of a reputation for herself in particular over the last few months by calling out not only the behavior of the Premier of Alberta, Jason Kenney, but by publicly calling for his resignation. Now, in particular, this MLA has decided to make some very, very strong statements in regards to the culture of toxicity and the problems with power dynamics that exist inside of government at all levels. And before we get into the interview, we want to just take a second to share her member statement that she delivered just a few days ago in the legislature. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Even a drop of water can erode a mountain. Dr. Norma, physician and black team leader for the Faculty of Medicine and the University of Toronto said these words as she spoke to racism, intercultural competencies and safety. We must be committed to making systemic change in all of our organizations and be empowered to create safe spaces so that people feel safe to disclose difficult and perhaps inappropriate behavior and situations. We are in positions of authority and we are held to a higher standard. Harassment can destroy a person or an organization and friendships. It's hard to build trust once harassment has been disclosed and even more challenging when the person who has found the courage to come forward does not have the support of those they've disclosed to. What will we tell our next generation about how we treated people in our institutions and in our province? This is not a partisan issue. It is a systemic issue that continues to be pushed further into the darkness by those who dare to come forward who are tossed away by those who they trust. These people are not attention seekers. They face humiliation for telling their truth and negative consequences like being fired or worse, isolation. The victims are being blamed. We are all responsible for this behavior and we are collectively accountable for changing this culture. It requires kindness for changing this culture and to be able to see this through and to ask the right questions. If we are bystanders to this behavior, we are part of the problem. We are responsible if money or job or credibility is used against a person or the culture allows harassment to continue. Do we only value people if they follow one ideology or thought process? Understand this. People who have faced family violence, domestic violence, sexual assault or harassment do not want to be defined by it. They want to be valued and heard and have their concerns understood and see change happen. It's remarkable that anyone comes forward given the chances of finding real solutions is so small, and yet these courageous few are hit with threats, minimizing their values and loss of opportunity and retaliation. So it should be clear to everyone at this point that I'm talking about MLA for Chestermere Strathmore, Leela Ahir. We are extremely grateful that Leela was willing to come onto the show and have a conversation with us about how she got into politics, what has been driving a lot of her decisions since being in government, and what she sees as the future for not only politics in Alberta, but the UCP. Here's our conversation with MLA for Chestermere Strathmore, Leela Ahir. Hey, Nate. Hi there, how are you doing today? How are you doing? Thank you so much for being willing to, to chat with us today. Really, really appreciate it. Well, I'm, I'm really honored that you'd want to speak with me. I, I was um, listening to some of your other podcasts and you're very, you're, you're very, very, very good at your job. You're very kind and you're thoughtful and your process, you ask some hard questions, but it's, uh, it's impressive. It's really nice to meet you. Well, oh, that's that's the nicest thing I think anyone has said about me in a while. So thank you for that. <laughs> uh, it's difficult and there's a lot of stuff going on. So it's hard to bring everything together and try and find out where things are at. So I, I really, I applaud you for doing it. And I really appreciate you taking time to talk with me. That's for sure. Well, uh, thank you again. I mean, it, it, it is, it, it's, a, I'm, I've been really looking forward to this. Uh, I'm, I'm, you hold the, the proud distinction of being the very first UCP MLA to have come on the show. And I, I got to say, I respect the hell out of that. Uh, so, so thank you for being willing to, to come on. Um, 
I, I really want to be as respectful as possible with your time because I know you have a limited time. So I'm going to just jump right in. But I'm a big believer that context is really, really important. So if you don't mind, I'd kind of like to start with the, the story of who is Leela here and how did you get into politics and what drove you to get into politics? Yeah, it's a it's a good. I I think it's a really neat story. I I have um, I've been involved in community for a long time. I think like most of us, you get involved at your community level as a volunteer. And I'm a musician, so um, and a music teacher, so you get to know all the kids in your community, right? And then, but my mom and dad were very very committed volunteers in our community. And when we moved out to Chestermere in um, in the 70s so I would have been around eight or nine years old I was probably the first person of color out here and, and my dad too my dad's um my dad's Southeast Asian he's black and Asian Irish English Scottish and Scandinavian so it's a really interesting mix and um and so you you build community very really quickly especially in a small community that was Chestermere at that time and my mom was involved with like the bridge club and all of that and so we did a lot of um community outreach at that time and you just sort of get pulled into that as a young person. And then even my sons who are 23 and 25 now, my oldest um, is the uh, former president of the Rotary Club out here in Chestermere. So he's, you know, done a lot of work. They both work for the food bank and have been on various committees together. My youngest son is autistic and is just this beautiful human. And he's, he's come so far, Nate, like he's broken through every barrier that could have possibly been put in front of him. He's a little musician as well, too. And is driving and has a job and gives back into the community in a lot of different ways. And so um, the, the pull into, you know, into service has always, always been there. It's a fundamental pillar of our family. So um, the, the move into politics, probably, I, I never saw it coming to be truthful <laughs> because I, as a music teacher in my community and a performer, right? So you're giving back in a lot of different ways, but I think in some ways the, very, very difficult life of being a musician and a performer and the critique that comes along with that has very much prepared me for where we sit right now, which is a huge privilege for me. So. I'm, I'm familiar with that, that musical critique. I come from a musical background myself, so having people say not nice things is well prepared me for this, this current gig, that's for sure. Everything from like what you're wearing to like the color of your fingernail polish it's it's really like it, it can be very um you have to debrief after you know being judged on a piece of oratorio or in your case your instrument of choice you know it's a it's a lot of work but i i really truly feel it prepared me for this job in a lot of different ways okay when you first started in politics and please correct me if i'm wrong but when you first started you started with the wild rose correct what what was it that that drew you to the wild rose so it's interesting it's actually it's a it's a new story too so um i'm a fiscal conservative like in terms of like if we put ourselves into packages that's sort of where i sit in in terms of policy i'm very socially compassionate i think like 90 percent of albertans just sort of sit into that space um but what i what really really drew me was the ideas like i'm a i love policy and so when i was looking at it from policy perspective in terms of how we interact with municipal affairs are the resources that we have here. And I'm not just talking about oil and gas, but manufacturing, farming. I come from a farming community and we, we've really seen an incredible amount of women really taking over in the farming communities and taking this forward and just seeing all of the incredible, my, and my dad's oil and gas. So I grew up out in the fields with my dad in those cold little, you know, portables out in the middle of, you know, nowhere while my dad went and kicked, um, his little devices to figure out making sure all of his devices were working and, you know, sitting with, with these lovely people in these cold portables with a cup of hot chocolate. And I used to collect all of the drafting pencils when I was little. So I had such a love of the province and the people. And so when you, when you put that all together in, in that one package, like you just, you learn so much about the people around you and such a deep love of their province and, and what it brings and the diversity and, um, you know, my dad, when he came here in 1963 from India, I remember him saying that he had never seen anything as beautiful as Canada. <laughs> he came to Alberta to literally minus 40 and was adopted by this beautiful family. There was, I think, six or seven young men who had come from India at that time. And George and Pansy Strange and Edmonton didn't have children of their own, kind of just took these boys in right off the airplane. And 
you know, taught them about Canadian culture and, you know, probably help you get their like first pair of winter boots, learn how to use the grocery store fund, doctor, all that kind of stuff. So my dad's integration into the culture of Canada was very loving and he became a huge patriot right off the bat. And everything I've learned to love about Canada has come from my dad who came from India. Everything that I've learned to love about culture and the background and my, my very, very interesting background has come from my mom who was a, you know, um, an only child and, um, ended up marrying this man who has come from a family of 11. <laughs> so very, very much integrated into the East Indian culture. And my dad's Hindu, my mom's Anglican. So there was just lots and lots of reasons to be involved. And, and the wild rose, to re, like to circle back to why you were asking me about why that party, is that there was a lack, I thought, of many, many things going on in the parties. And I actually didn't come into it willingly, honestly, Nate. Like I I had worked, I, I shouldn't say that I've been working on the policy side of Wild Rose probably since 2010 was probably when I started looking at it from the fiscal side. But in terms of running, it was never my idea. I ended up, the floor crossings happened in uh, just before 2015, right? And so I'd been working um, on the campaigns of the people in my areas at that time. And I was literally teaching a choir. I had, I had five choirs at the time. So I had just finished choir practice. And came down and there were seven gentlemen sitting in my kitchen and they had asked they were saying you know we think we have a candidate and i'm like great you know when do we start door knocking all this kind of stuff and they said it's you and i literally fell off my rocker and these guys said to me they're like you're what's the future of politics that's what they said to me it was not my i never saw myself in that light they certainly saw me and they had to chase me for two months let me tell you i was not convinced i didn't know if i had the capacity or even the competency um, to be able to do this job, I was very nervous about my ability to support and, 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 and nurture the relationships and the community building that I've been part of my whole life here. So it was really very interesting and quick entr entrance into politics. Okay. And so you were, you were Wild Rose first, and then you went through the, the I'll, I'll say, unity transition uh, to the current incarnation of, of conservatism by and large in Alberta. Um, what was that experience like for you? Uh, well, I'll be, I'll be very honest. I wasn't sure about unity and I, I was, I, I was really committed to trying to understand, and it wasn't even necessarily around an ideology of conservatism, Nate. It was about what good governance looked like to me at that point in time. And so I, I learned a lot about people throughout that transition quite it was quite the undertaking and I think if you talk to anybody in politics they'll probably if they're telling you the truth they'll tell you this you end up spending a lot of time with people you would never think you'd spend time with like people in your past that you wouldn't have been able to relate to or even talk to suddenly become interesting partners in a in in something that we all believe in that you're united you're united around so that was an interesting part of it I learned a lot but I also became even more committed to what I saw conservatism as being, what I, where, where I fell in, which is I, anybody who talks, anybody you talk to, like I am smack dab, center, and then right on the fiscal side of things. And so, and, and because I think all people, I think all of us need to look at our fiscal capacity. It doesn't mean that um, it's a responsibility I have to you. I, I have the privilege as a government right now of taking in your tax dollars and then using them in the province, it's not my money. And I, I owe it to you with transparency and honesty to be able to tell you where those dollars are going. So that is a, that's a founding feature for me of why I choose where I sit in, in the political realm. Okay. It's, I, I have to ask, it's interesting that you, you, you said the, one of the big things that you were looking for was good governance. Do you feel that you got what you were, were hoping for? I think we were on the right path. I think we were starting on that road. Um, and I'm not going to use COVID as an excuse. That's a, it's a lame excuse to use for um, any change of the government. I think I think that everybody who has the entire world has had to reconcile decisions, good, bad, or otherwise, that we have made along this pathway. So I'm not going to use that as, an, as a reason or an excuse for explaining where I'm coming from. I, like I said, I, I don't think that that's I don't think that's appropriate. Um, but I think. Um, what I expected in good governance, what my expectation is and continues to be, is around understanding the people that are around us. And this is one of the things I think that we're learning in politics nowadays is that you can have the smartest people around you, but if they don't resonate, 
with the public if they're not able to speak to you if they don't if if yours if the, the assumption is is that government knows better than the people that they serve you lose everything that you've gained in earning the respect of people around you and you know we always had this discussion around the NDP right when they were in government is that you know they were saying that they knew better than the people well I honestly think that in in some of the pieces of comfort especially with failure leadership with Prima Kenny I think that he's also done the same thing I think that there is a lot of um I know better and I'm you know this is what's going to happen as opposed to bringing people along with you I think there's there's a lot to be said for um, bringing people along that journey with you. A lot of, you know, a lot of the decisions that we make at the government level are difficult. And especially with COVID, it's been really hard. And, and I say that loosely. I, I don't mean that to sound like, like it's, it's just a not, like it is it's traumatic for all of us, especially the people who are um, getting the information as it's being rolled out to them. But if you're as, as a person who sat at the cabinet table or a person who's in the government are also not not understanding how to disseminate how to be able to disseminate the information and get it out to people in a timely manner in order to help them in order to make decisions um there is a, a level of arrogance that comes along with that that does not translate to the average person who is trying to figure out i got three kids i have them in two sports i'm supposed to go here how do i cohort what do i do like that is for an average family person and i'm just an average girl I, there's nothing special about me i just work hard okay I, I was trying to put, you know, you put yourself into it. Okay, well, you've got all of these things going on. How do you share that with a family? Well, you have to be able to come humbly, humbly before people and say, look it, this is a schmozzle. <laughs> I'm making any excuses for making mistakes, but this is, this is where we're at. So we're going to try this, okay? And bear with me. And can you please like help us to understand how is this working for you? How, you know, like, and work with folks and try and understand how it is, especially when it came to vaccine, right? And really, really keeping that gas pedal on and helping people to understand what vaccine means for folks and, you know, trying to um, be as kind and compassionate in that education as possible so that, um, you know, you, you have credibility, right? As you're coming forward with that, because once you lose trust with people, it doesn't matter. You can have all the best. And we've, we've accomplished 85% of our mandate. That should be good news, but it's very, very hard to, tell the good news about the work that's going on when um, that you, when you've lost trust of the very, very people who put you there of the privilege of the place where I'm sitting right now. Okay. Um, I, I want to, there's a, there's a whole lot that, that I want to explore in what you just said, but before we do, one of the fundamental things that I, I, I want to get your opinion on, because this is something that I've heard repeated over and over again in politics, is the notion that if you can find a political party that you agree with 60% of the time, that's probably better than you're going to do with any other political party. And you've, you've found your, your political home. I'm curious, is, is, would you agree with that? And, and secondary to that, would you, would you say that the, the UCP separate from the leadership still represents that for you? Yeah, that's why I, I'm, I'm absolutely committed to the principles of what we got elected on. And that was working hard, being humble and keeping our commitments. That's what I believed in. That's what I worked on. That's that's where I come from. So I'm 100% committed to those principles. And especially after all of the work and bringing together this, you know, sort of marriage of convenience of all these different conservatives from one end of the spectrum to another, there has to be a tremendous amount of respect and a desire to build that family and put it together, right? In order to make sure that what you're bringing to people is a unified front, a family that respects the families of Alberta. So I'm 100% committed to that, which is why I've been asked in the past, like, would I leave? You know, would I go to another party? Would I do all of these things? Well, I, I don't understand why, in principle, why I would be asked to leave when I'm actually responsible to try and make those changes happen from within the party that I've committed to. If I do that, Nate, if I run away from this at a time because I happen to be being bullied or they're trying to push me out because they took away my ministry or, or whatever, like, how does that in any way change? And I'm not just talking about my party. Let's take the partisanship out of it. This is an issue that is, um, it is a structural and a systemic issue with all political parties. Right across the spectrum, we've seen it happen you know, in the NDP, we've seen it happen with Trudeau for sure. You know, there, these are all systemic issues. So me as just a person, all party politics aside, 
what is my responsibility within my party to see change happen? I have to stay and I want to stay. If anybody else who is not able to do what I believe that they should do wants to even step by all means and please step down. And I, like I said, I've asked for the premier's re resignation for that reason, because there are wonderful people around this table who can take us through COVID and help us put us back together and lead with unity instead of division. And that's one of the things that I think is most important right now is that regardless of how you vote or where your ideology lies or what ends up happening in the next election, God only knows what will happen there, but that we are able to put our best foot forward and give people those options so that it's a good option. It's not just an option. It's a great option, an option where we've learned from our mistakes. We've learned from our past. We're, we're a new party relatively, right? So there's going to be mistakes. So why not take the opportunity to look at the the mistakes that we made, the good stuff we've done, and then put that together and give people a really, really awesome option. Okay. The reason why I wanted to, to sort of explore that a little bit is because I think that I would be uh, fairly safe in saying that you're probably, to many people who are engaged in politics in Alberta, one of the more confusing figures, uh, simply because you you have had these moments where you where you show up and you strongly advocate for things that you're passionate about. And I really appreciate that you brought up the, the systemic issue because I absolutely 100% agree with you. It's not limited to one uh, political party and it's certainly not limited to one end of the political spectrum. Um, one of the things that we're going to do for this episode before we get into the, the interview part is we're going to play two clips. One of the clips you've already kind of addressed where you talked about the why should you be the one to, to leave the party. Um, and the other one is you gave a very powerful member statement uh, just recently in the legislature where you talked about some of these issues of systemic problems and bullying. And I totally understand that the there was a I suspect that a lot of the motivation for that statement stemmed from the fact uh, that there have been quite a few recent controversies surrounding power dynamics and abuse of power dynamics uh, in the legislature recently. But I have to be honest, when I, when I listened to it around the third or fourth time, I couldn't help but think, I wonder how much of this applies to you, because you have made some very strong statements. You've publicly called for the resignation of the premier. Uh, you took a very strong stand against the, the Sky Palace patio party or whatever it's going around <laughs> is being called now. Uh, and you have very clearly so, uh, aligned yourself uh, with the, the victim uh, in the recent lawsuit that's been brought against the, the government. Um, what would you say to people who are trying to, to understand, you know, on, on one hand, we have Leela here who's taking these, these very bold, very costly stances, because as you pointed out earlier, it did cost you your, your, your ministry. Um, I don't know if it's been publicly stated as much or, or, or not, but that's, that's certainly the perception. Um, and I think you'd have to be pretty naive to think that <laughs> those two things weren't related. Uh, but what would you say to people who are trying to understand how is it on one hand that Leela here can come out swinging so hard on, on, on these issues um, and then perhaps on the issues that they want to see Leela here speaking loudly on, uh, they're not seeing the same passion. What would you say to them? Well, I think that uh, <laughs> being active on all of these things, it, it takes a lot of, um, it's not about being angry, it's about grace right and you want to make sure that you have all the facts and that the information that you're perpetuating isn't just because you're angry or frustrated or you want to see something just you know you, you want to I don't know be in the media I know a lot of people have said that 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 might be the reason that I'm doing this but if that was the case then I would have tried you know obviously I would have tried to keep my ministry and keep my job and just keep my head down and keep going if that was an issue for me then I wouldn't have spoken up in the first place they think that when you're looking at systemic issues, trying to um, embrace all of the issues at one time, you're never going to be able to get anywhere. Sometimes you have to be able to figure out where you can make a difference, how it is to structure that, and what the demands are in regards to seeing that systemic change happen. So it might not, I might not be able to be all things to all people, and I, I appreciate that, and um, I'm not trying to be. It would be, I think, very disingenuous for me to just go after absolutely every issue without knowing fully well what I can actually do to help change that particular situation, but also what my place is in, in all of that. And so sometimes when you're advocating, um, and I believe me, Nate, I would have preferred to be able to advocate on these things 
with my team, right? As opposed to being, as you said, an outlier and confusing to people. Maybe confusion is good because I have always made a promise that I would hold myself and my government accountable. You know, that that just I, being part of the team is, is an important piece of it. And I long to see great leadership come out from this. Um, but when your internal mechanisms are not working in order to be able to see structural change happen, if you have you have to be willing to step out of that. But there's very few of us who've been able to step out of it in the past. If you look at, and I don't mean to compare myself to the amazing Jody Rabel, Wilson Rabel. I mean, we're not like what she has done and what she's accomplished is very significantly larger than what I'm doing right now. But if you look at those of us who have stepped forward, ask us where where things have gone. Jody didn't get reelected, right? She's got this amazing book out that is going to impact and change the way that we look at politics, thank God. But it is a huge, huge um, chance that you're taking with your credibility and who you are. So making sure that the issues that we're bringing forward, you have to have, we have to be able to know that we stand with credibility on those and not just going for an issue for the sake of the issue or because it's a great Twitter moment or whatever. I, for me, I have to think about those and I have to think about the grace that I need to come forward with because I believe that people are depending on me to tell the truth. And I'm not going to take that for granted just in order to be able to get a quick story or a tweet out of it. it to me, it's worth so much more than that. You're worth more than that to me. The people of the province are worth so much more to me. And I think that when you have leadership that doesn't listen or is not empathetic or uh, doesn't care about building team to address the challenges that we're facing um, and that you surround yourself with a select few, you know, you don't, you're not a united anything party that becomes about a one person. I didn't join this team for one person. I joined this team because I believe the team was the best representation for the people of Alberta. And those are my bosses. So at the end of the day, when I speak to, you know, and I, I the word constituent doesn't begin to describe the phenomenal human beings that I am blessed to represent or the people that I've met throughout my ministry time. Um, but we, you need to be a fully functioning party right to engage in a way that it's critical given the challenges that we're facing right now so the issues that I am it's not that I'm choosing to get behind only one or two issues or particular issues these just issues have chosen me largely and I feel that I have the premise and the wherewithal to be able to shine a light on something that could strategically change the way we do politics forever regardless of whether I'm there or not because really at the end of the day what am I? I'm one little, you know, I always say this to my kids, you know, maybe one day when I'm a great grandma, they'll tell their, my great granddaughter is, oh, their great grandma was a minister for 10 seconds. You know, it's not matter in the grand scheme of things. Right. So the, the truth is though, is that it can help to, to plow through some of the systemic issues because I have the platform to do so regardless of the impact that it has on my career and my life. I can walk away from this knowing that I've done everything possible to make a change that I believe is important as you go forward so that as this next generation of politicians come forward, who are going to be so much better than we are, that they we've paved the way for them, that we've broken through some of those glass ceilings, that we've removed some of the barriers and that we've given them the premise. Because if we don't start off with a safe space for people in politics, and if somebody like Ariella Kimmel can't go to the senior leadership with this situation, knowing that she's going to be safely handled and, and looked at as the competent, amazing human being that she is and believed for what she is told, we've already missed the mark. We've already missed the mark. And so creating those safe spaces for people to be able to have these conversations, I'll tell you, I've had 19 emails in the last three days of people disclosing situations that have happened over like the last 30 years. So this is not a new issue, but if I don't speak to it right now, well, I have the opportunity and the platform to do so. Shame on me. It's as simple as that. I got to do a little bit of a rapid fire because I only got four minutes left with you. And there's a few points that I definitely want to make sure that we hit off. Uh, so as much as we, as, as much as possible is to yes or no, um, we've certainly received no shortage of, of messages from people as well, uh, where people have talked about a toxic and unhealthy environment at the legislature in regards to alcohol use. Have you seen that? Uh, unhealthy, no, but I've seen alcohol use. Absolutely, yes. 
Okay. Um, Mr. Brian Jean, the old leader of the Wild Rose, is uh, definitely making some very big waves. Uh, and I got to say, I, I am impressed, for lack of a better word, with the... He's, the bold stance he's taken is how I'll phrase it. Um, would you want to see Brian Jean get the nomination for to be the candidate in Fort Mac? Do you believe that he should have his nomination form signed? If that's what the constituency wants. I, I, I'm going to have the same issue. Hopefully I'll get my nomination signed too. So <laughs> I'd love to see him get his nomination signed because that means that there's hope for me. <laughs> okay. Um just to be very, very blunt, you've said it publicly several times in the past. Do you still want to see Jason Kenney step down as leader? Yeah, I, I want him to have that grace. I want him to understand that he's not resonating with people and that he's not helping the province and that we can acknowledge the work that's been done and then have somebody else who has the voice and the heartbeat of the people come forward and get us through the rest of this pandemic. I would love to see that happen. I think it would show tremendous grace on his part. Uh, to understand that he's not resonating with people and to step down immediately. Okay. Um, three more and then I'm done. Uh, to the best that I can see, you are still listed as the deputy leader uh, for the UCP. And I know there's been some people who have speculated that because of that role, uh, this is all a long game that you're playing to, to become, the, at the very least, the interim leader. Do you have any interest in that? Is that part of the motivation? I would be up to the MLAs, right? Like it's not up to me to make that determination. Um, either way, you have <laughs> anybody who knows leadership, it is a long road. And I'm not even <laughs> looking at that right now. I just want, and I actually think he has some really competent um, people around his table right now at the ministry table that could easily step into this interim role at this point in time and uh, give the people of Alberta breathing room. And, uh, and, and a moment of levity about where we are at this moment um, in particular. I mean, we've got some incredible women around that, uh, around the ministry table right now that I think could step into that very, very easily and, um, and do what's needed to be done in order to get us through this fourth wave. And God willing, um, whatever comes after this, but, you know, there, there needs to be level of competency and some calm and compassion that needs to Which happen. two would you pick? Oh, my goodness. Uh, I, I right off the top, but I think like there's lots there, but I like Sonia Savage, Raj and Sonny, easy right off the top of those two incredible women could step into this role. Raj and I, sorry, uh, Minister Sonny is one of the most powerful roles in the provinces we have right now, uh, Sonia Savage, um, he, I, and with her competencies and what she understands about the province and resource development and stewardship, she's a beautiful choice. I don't know if she'd want it. I haven't spoken to her about that, but, <laughs> but I think that either of the, I mean, there's many, but those are, I mean, off the top of my head, very easily could pick those two. Yeah. Perfect. Last question. Will, will you do me a favor and, and tell Matt Wolf that we say hi? <laughs> I don't know how to answer that. <laughs> I, I think he'll probably he'll probably hear about it one way or the other. Um, uh, MLA here. I don't know if that's I'm, I'm the. I'm mean, I'm just a regular girl. I sit here with this privilege, but I'm Leela to everyone. They're okay. Of... Leela, I want to say a tremendous thank you for for the bravery that you've demonstrated not only over the couple of weeks but just in coming on this show uh i really really appreciate it uh and i respect it uh, i think that all too often in the conversations that we have surrounding politics at any level we often forget that human beings are not one-dimensional figures there's almost always nuance and and depth involved that doesn't necessarily make it to the 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 public eye and i Really appreciate you being willing to take this time to have this conversation. And I think that puts me right at the half hour mark. And I know that your assistant's in the background somewhere probably texting you saying, get off the darn thing with him. But I just want to say thank you again. It's my pleasure. And I, I was as excited as you were to meet you. I think you do a wonderful job. I, what we're doing. No, but Nate, you have to be able to ask the hard questions. And if, if I can't answer them, I, I am not worthy of my position. It's really that simple. So I really appreciate the fact that you would take the time to speak with me too. So thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you. Well, you have a good evening. Uh, and I, for what it's worth, I, I hope you keep firing with all the passion that you are, because I think that that's more than anything, that's what our province needs right now. Thank you, Nate. And take care of yourself and your family. Stay safe. Much love. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye. 
And that's it for another episode of The Breakdown. As always, if you appreciate the kind of content that we're trying to produce here, we'd ask you to consider signing up to be one of our Patreon supporters at www.patreon.com slash thebreakdownab. The reality is, is that it's almost entirely due to the support of our Patreon supporters that we're able to do the kind of content that we do here uh, and the variety of ways that we do it. So we want to say a big thank you to all of our supporters, but if you would be willing to become one of those supporters, you can do that at our Patreon site for just the price of a fancy cup of coffee every month. Additionally, if you appreciated what you heard on this episode, if you could consider following us on any of our social media platforms, sharing the episode, and as well, leaving a review, because that's the kind of thing that helps us get our content in front of more people. Thank you again for taking the time to listen, take care of each other, and stay safe.